And it seems that there is no plans for an end of the war. And the war has become, usually people go into war, countries go into war for a purpose, either to conquer a piece of land or to take over parts, um, to take parts of resources, or even just like kill a number of people and finish. Um, Sadly, it seems that this war is the continuation of the war. It seems that this is its the own purpose to continue that there is no peace, there's no stability, there's no possibility to rebuild. Uh, Afternoon, everyone. Uh, Afternoon, at least to those of you on the East Coast and various other places. Um, I am on the West Coast in Seattle. Uh, My name is Doug Thorpe. I'm with the Diocese of Olympia's Committee on Justice and Peace in the Holy Land. I want to welcome you to this, next in a series of webinars sponsored by the Stones Cry Out Delegation, building on our in-person delegation in Palestine this past February and March, which uh, culminated in a gathering in Washington, D.C. in March uh, of advocacy, uh, worship, and protest. And um, this series, the summer, will again culminate um, September 23rd to the 27th with um, another uh, return trip to Washington, D.C. And I see that Mike Spath has put um, on the screen the webinar schedule so that uh, you can uh, see what's coming up. Um, These webinars are designed to inform, inspire, and empower our advocacy for this coming September's gathering, which will include, again, direct actions, demonstrations, worship, prayer. If you're interested in joining us in September, feel free to contact me, Doug Thorpe. You can do that pretty simply via email, dthorpe, D-T-H-O-R-P-E, at spu.edu. Again, that's Doug Thorpe, D. Thorpe, at spu.edu. Our next webinar in this series is with Rifat Cassis, Global Kairos for Justice in Kairos, Palestine, along with Munther Isaac, Christmas, uh, excuse me, Christmas Lutheran Church, Bethlehem, and Director of the Christ at the Checkpoint. That will be on this Thursday in just three days on June 20th, beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. Pacific Time here in the United States. And I want to thank my partners and the planning team, Kairos USA's Mark Braverman and Michael Spath, Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, as well as the sponsoring organizations that are listed there in front of you. So, Omar Harami, um, Executive Director of the Sabil Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center, uh, based uh, outside of Jerusalem. I'm sure many of you on this call have uh, been at the Sabil Center, um, have met Omar. And so again, Omar, um, it's great to have you with us. Um, I'm wondering, as people continue to gather here on the on the uh, webinar, Um, You know, you and I talked very, very briefly just before this began. Um, Certainly, I can feel the weight um, all the way across the seas that that you're feeling. Um, If you would, um, let's just take a moment um, and open in prayer um, and just hold this space together um, as we begin our time um, in, in conversation. So thank you, Omar. Thank you very much, my friend Doug. Um, it's always a great idea to start with with words of prayers. Dear God, we thank you for the many blessings that you continue to provide us with. We give you thank for the friendships, solidarity, for the commitment of so many people around the world who care for one another. 
Continue, Lord, to inspire the people of goodwill, the people of conscience, to continue to work hard despite of the realities that we face. May we all, as a global community, brothers and sisters, siblings in humanity, work hand in hand to defend the human rights of everyone on this planet. Defend every life, the life of your creation, dear God. Lord, strengthen us as we face very powerful powers and structures that seem to have lost every logic, lost the ability to see the humanity, to feel compassion, and is determined to only serve its own interests. We know, Lord, that we are able to overcome. You have told us, and our ancestors and many people around the world have showed us that it is possible. May you, your will be done. May freedom come. May we overcome. All of this we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it is important to get grounded. Um, I mean, obviously, we're speaking in the context of what is continuing to go on in Gaza. Um, and then not just in Gaza, but obviously um, around you in the West Bank. Um, it, it's easy. I, I'm sure that most people on this call that you know, are familiar with the realities but you know just again to put this into a a, a context i've been reading uh raja shaheda's what does israel fear from palestine published 2024 and he's referring to an israeli soldier serving in hebron who was asked to map the interior of the house of one of the palestinian residents in the old city and therefore, he, the, the soldier experienced the effect of the treatment meted out to the Palestinians. He objected to this, and his officer said, and I'm quoting, we've been doing mapping every night, three or four houses a night for 40 years. If we go into their houses all the time, if you arrest people all the time, if they feel terrified all the time, they will never attack us. They will only feel chased after. I mean, that's the reality that... Um, I, I, I feel, at least in the United States, most people uh, are not reading Raja Shaheda. Um, they are not aware of what's going on, and obviously that has only deepened. Um, so um, if we can just begin, um, tell us, Omar, a little bit about um, the reality that you're experiencing on the ground. And yeah, let's just start there. Um, I grew up um, under occupation, so did my parents, and I mean, my, my many of them, almost everybody in our community has either experienced Nakba or 1967 or the numerous wars that have taken place. I mean, since 2007, there has been five wars in Gaza. Um, so our reality, sadly, sadly, is the reality of war and oppression and ongoing dispossession. We don't know any other um, way of life. Some of us are blessed and have had the chance to live abroad, to study through either studying or just work or just be part of life um, for one reason or another to live abroad and to experience some type of normal life. And I say normal life, every community has its own challenges and its own problems. But normal life, I mean when there isn't gunshots and bombs falling and uh, a military, a foreign military controls every aspect of your life. So reality is normal, um, normal life under occupation. And... Um, but since October 7th, 
the whole country, I mean, it is Palestinians and uh, most Palestinians and most Israelis. This is the worst mm -hmm. period of violence that we have both, we are both experiencing. And I'm not going to come and just throw numbers of Palestinians dying, Israelis dying. You know, it is, um, there's widespread destruction and there is um, serious uh, possibilities of an escalation to even much worse situation in Palestine, Israel, and on uh, on the regional level, and that must and that needs to be also reminded for people who are very much aware about what's happening in Palestine and Israel. Um, so the reality is not um, actually since October seventh, it's not the normal life under occupation. This is not another one more war. Um, of 1960, uh, of uh, the wars on Gaza. And I think most of us want to wish that this is another war, exactly what happened in, after Gaza, there will be a ceasefire, we'll donate some money, and people will figure out how to move forward, and things, and life will move on. I I believe we're, we're this is the beginning of uh, decades of uh, serious conflict um, between um Palestine and Israel, and also this will affect on the international level. I hope I'm wrong, but honestly, I think we need to prepare for the worst scenario. Um, some numbers say that there's like around 40,000 people who are killed in Gaza. Um, some now are actually expecting that the number is over 100 or close to 200,000 people killed or died um, in the past few months that the situation is so difficult, you can no longer count people. I know from the people, the little people that I know in Gaza, people now refuse to go to funerals or to be part of prayers um, um, of the dead. People are exhausted. You know, they've said we've been at so many funerals. We've been at so many um, burial places. We can't even remember where our family members are buried. I hope that all of this is an exaggeration, but at least from the major institutions like universities, hospitals, schools, um, um, uh, churches, almost all of it is in ruins. And I'm afraid that the situation is, is complete destruction in Gaza. And it seems that there is no plans for an end of the war. And the war has become, usually people go into war, countries go into war, for a purpose, either to conquer a piece of land or to take over parts, um, to take parts of resources, or even just like kill a number of people and finish. Um, sadly, it seems that this war is the continuation of the war. It seems that this is its the own purpose to continue that there is no peace, there's no stability, there's no possibility to rebuild. The war will continue as long as there's people alive until there is people are able to find a way out of Gaza. And that has becoming the reality, the reality of making life for people to continue to chase people from one corner to another in Gaza until they are completely convinced that they either turn against one another or just go into the sea um, um, and drown themselves. I cannot believe how much depression there is in Gaza, how much um, the situation, people are no longer asking to be fed, they're no longer asking for clean water, people are not asking to sleep on a um, um, in a tent. The situation is, is, is miserable. I was speaking, I met, I was traveling and I met somebody from South Sudan and Sudan is also not having it easy. Yeah. Uh, um, but my, my friend told me that at least, you know, there is a way out, you know, that, you know, it is, it's, if you want to escape, there's a way to escape, if you are able to escape. And that's not the situation in Gaza, you know, it is, it's, um, um, my friend in Gaza said, imagine that you are, it feels as if we are little children, most of us, and we are with the drunk father, abusive father with a belt and slam and beating us up and we run from one room to another there is no safe place and the only thing that we hear is the cries of our brothers and sisters and our mother weeping um, there is no food there is no security there is no hope that any of the doors would open we just run, run from one place to another and each corner in Gaza reminds us of, uh, of a crime 
So that's the reality. I mean, for us, we are, uh, and it's much worse for us, you know, it is sometimes it's a blessing to be among the people who are oppressed and the people who are suffering. And that's why I think that's part of the wonderful people who decided to come on a delegation um, are, or are coming on solidarity delegations because I think we feel helpless. And you say that maybe if we are in Jerusalem, if we're in the West Bank, I know it's, or if we get close to Gaza, at least we feel um, at least we're present, um, even for a short period of time, with the people who are suffering. It's the worst if you know and you're observing of what's taking place. Um, it's a very messed up feeling, you know, because it's we know that this is what we we pray about those people. We we're watching those people suffering. We're trying to do our best to those people, you know. It is it's, but we are. Um, maybe we know more than what those people know. Um, because we have like some, we have we're having some coverage of the situation, and it feels it feels so guilty, you know, when you drink your cup of coffee or you wear um, a, a clean shirt or you're able to shave your beard or to wash your face <laughs> or to have you know to have a um, a drink of cold water. You know, nine months with no electricity. Nine months with no electricity. Um, it's you know it's your people dream. Um, uh, of the time that they're able to find a way somebody to um, um, uh, to recharge their computer or if there's no computer but at least their phones and yeah it's all taking place and we know about it it's not that the world doesn't know about it if the world doesn't know about what's happening in Palestine then we, we live in, in a broken world because nobody knows about what's taking place in 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 the sub-Saharan um, desert. Nobody knows about what's happening in in Sudan. Nobody knows um, uh, about you know what's happening in Latin America and Guatemala or or so many places. People, some people know if they are, but they're a minority. But the maximum attention that can be done on Palestine has been already done. We have to admit the world knows. And the world either is doesn't have the energy, is preoccupied with their own concerns, or we as human species are we we are failing, or um, uh, or we're facing very you know it's we're facing empire, and uh, empire is able to control every aspect of our lives as humanity. So yeah, that's the reality is that we're living in so it's it's a big bubble and we're trying to to figure out how can we escape this reality? How can we escape this matrix um you know that we're living in? And because it's we, we owe it to the children, we owe it to the people who are naive, who are praying for salvation to come. And we know the only salvation is gonna come is when this drunken, mad, abusive father just falls asleep and he's not falling asleep yeah um that analogy um I, i'm i'm tempted to even put it more strongly that that you know a drunken a, a abusive father who is is beating kids i mean here it's it's an, a drunken abusive father who is killing kids and there's still no you know uh holding uh to uh, accountability for that um um so yeah it's it's uh, it's desperate um you know i'll put a plug in for um the organization we are not numbers um um which tries to get the stories from folks in gaza out um uh, uh through you know editors and writers so if folks want to get some of the voices on the ground uh, that'd be a good place to go we are not numbers um Omar, say a little bit about what you're what you're seeing, um, you know, where you are, your neighborhood um, and in, in Jerusalem. You know, we hear just bits and pieces um, of what's going on. Um, the Armenian quarter, um, Silwan, um, just, yeah, what can you tell us about what you're seeing uh, right around you? Um, we, I mean, it is, it's what we're seeing and experiencing is the continuation of Nakbe. Um, I, I say now I'm using this terminology um, in the meetings uh, here at Sabil. So we, we believe that it's, uh, I believe 
that the first, the beginnings of the Nakbe started, or the small Nakbe was when there was a decision by a group of people, regardless of their motives, to take over a place, a piece of land, to empty this piece of land from um, as many people as possible um, and to establish their own government. So when some, when a group of people, Zionism decided to make this decision was our same, was our first Nakbe, that, you know, we became a prey. And this is, and sadly today, it is, it's Zionism is facing serious challenges because it's, if you look at historical Palestine, from the river to the sea, um, the non-Jews or the Palestinians, if we dare to call ourselves how we wish, the Palestinians are close or 50%, maybe a little bit over, maybe a little bit less, but we're over 50%. And we inhabit, uh, and we are indigenous to, to many important cities that are important to the narrative of connection of the Jewish people to the land, like the West Bank especially. So there needs to be serious intervention from Israel um, to make this Zionist project succeed. You know, it's been 76 years, so many people have died, so much money has been spent, um, so much ener energy has been invested into this project. They need to continue their interventions. So to empty the land and to decrease the number of the Palestinians could be the continuing of the war of Gaza so that the people are forced to to either go to Egypt or to drown in the sea. So they used this. They used it also with, they also used, or they, ha, or they used the tactic of, uh, and they're using this tactic not only in the West, uh, in, in Gaza. There's close to 3,000 Palestinians who have been displaced in Area C. 55, over 55 communities in Area C that they were displaced without being involved in an October 7th or being part, it was an opportunity, um, the rise of uh, violence that those communities were forced by gunpoint to leave and who did not leave, um, faced serious violence, either by the massacring of their cattle or their sheep or burning their tents or even shooting many within the community. Force remains to be the same tactic that was used in 1948, is, be, is continues to be used in Gaza and in the West Bank. They also use the tactics of, you know, it's, um, of forging papers, trying to go into shady deals, um, uh, corrupting um, the already corrupt leaders, you know, like the Armenian community um, is trying to 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 defend their, their rights, their historical land, because it's some members in their community or church leaders got engaged with corrupt deals or shady deals. You have also the tactics of um, of also incentives, inc giving incentives to local communities. And, you know, it is it's through proper deals, take a lot of money and just leave, disappear. It happens, this is very much um, um, important location called City of Abroad. So there is a project, a machine that is is continuing to implement the Zionist project. We have we want the whole the, the majority of the land with as minimum uh, numbers of Palestinians. It's not working. They need to deal with us. Excellent opportunity for the fanatics. Um, it's going to be a costly. Um, it's going to put Israel as um, to black. Um, Israel will become the black sheep of the international community. But they really don't care because the international community is not like with high morals and high ethical values, sadly. And with the cover and the protection of the United States, people are able to do messed up decisions, you know, if it's you have the right connections. We see it with political leaders. It used to be morals and ethics that would guide the communities to elect leaders who would help them in to make the world a better place. That's not the case, you know. You give enough money and resources for the political people, they're able to brainwash the people, to lie to the people, and then to justify why they're not implementing it, um, and convince the world, you know, it is, it's why we live in a broken world, and so that people blame each other, you know. Poor, poor Americans blame poor migrants and poor people of color, so on. 
um, for why it's not working. Well, if they look at the cash balances, it's the rich who are making the money, crazy amounts of money. And nobody's able to come and say, but aren't we as a government should take care of everyone? Aren't we all as a communities? Don't we, we haven't we created states so that we can take care of the, the vulnerable, not to make billionaires, multi-billionaires. Um, so I think as humans, you know, we have a lot of work to do, honestly, to address the, the, the crappy situation that we're living in. You know, it's if we want to remain as, you know, these lost sheep that um, are unable to, to make the right decisions or to exercise their rights, to, to safeguard their rights, um, it's just going to become worse and worse and worse. You know, they might give us a little bit more water, a little bit more food, but definitely they will not give us enough, the majority of the people, um, to have a life, a secure life that would also make them to think in a, um, in a critical way of how to make society and the world a better place. But in the cradle of civilizations in the Levant, where we live, um, where we are blessed, this is the most fertile land for civilizations. And it was fertile for, for civilizations and religions to flourish and ideas to come up around the Mediterranean because there was enough food um, and security for people to feed themselves and people were, were, uh, were addressing their needs. And it created more time for people um, to question and to build societies, to create laws. Today, we live in a world that it is, it's, you have to work multiple jobs all the time. You know, you're chasing to get the sustainability that you need or the security, the food security um, for most people. And by the time that you accomplish this, you're close to retirement. You you chase your health sector, you know, and then you find out that, you know, the health sector is not working very well. So you reinvest your money or respend yeah. the money. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I want to um, come back to uh, a specific that uh, I, I believe actually today's the Sabil wave of prayer is referencing the situation at Tent of Nations. Um, and this is a, a microcosm of the, the, the larger piece of what you're talking about. Um, it, it mentioned that um, uh, the, the court case, and I think probably most people on this call will be familiar with uh, the situation at Tent of Nations, and, and maybe Omar, you can briefly sketch that in, but they, uh, they uh, uh, obviously have an ongoing court case, but quite recently, I'm not sure what the date, but um, while I gather they were in court, um, there were theft of animals on the farm. Um, uh, do you know anything further about this and uh, specifics about this or what's going on with uh, Dawood? Yes, I mean, especially after October 7th, there has been an increased number of attacks yes. by, you know, by settlers or outlaws or by... Um, um, by suspicious people, let's say, to continue to attack the farm and to make it extremely difficult to continue to living on the farm. So you, you can go multiple times to the court. So I mean, it is, it's, 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 it's you know, at some times, you know, um, there's 30 court cases that the wood is going on. On the same day, you know, it is on the, the at the same time, 30 court cases going from one court to another court cases. He lives in court. You know, it is it's, in a way he's like this, uh, this widow with the unjust judge, you know, keeps right. going and saying, yeah, grant me justice. And I know it is, it's, I don't think that there is a space for him to be. It's not only him. It was also his father and his grandfather from one court case to another. And not everybody would like to live um, between 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 yeah. judges, you know, people have a life, and you get burnt out just going, and you you get sick from listening your to yourself speaking out, and you know it's, yeah. you know we all know that Dawood is has a newsletter, he speaks out, he attends conferences, he keeps saying his story multiple times a day, sadly, on some cases. And the, the system is broken. The system is broken. There's no justice. You know, it is, it's, you can assume 
you can assume that it is if you speak and you educate that the world will have an intervention. You know, if it's Israel is a very strong state, and um, the unjust powers are very powerful. If Dawood does not have a just case, why would he be in 40 cases going up and down all for 40 years? The government would have taken over the land if they have a proof. It's only because he is willing to continue to fight. So um, the bigger picture is much more important than the individual, you know, if they stole a chicken or they stole a cow. Um, the bigger problem is that this is a decision that, you know, that they invest so much money and resources in making the world also. The wood is not sick or tired of his story, but eventually many people will become sick and tired and they want a new story. And when it becomes no longer popular and there aren't enough people willing to listen to this story, it will be the time to take it off. Yeah. Um, there's a question from our friend Sarah Elfner Seals about uh, home demolitions. It, uh, has there been uh, an up uptick in home demolitions in the West Bank uh, that you're aware of? Yeah. I mean, especially in Jerusalem. So home demolitions, they take place for multiple reasons. So one part, the biggest part, they do it as um, that you don't have a building permit. So in area C and, and especially in East Jerusalem, you need to obtain a, milit um, a, per a building permit like in any country around the world or any municipality to build your own house. Now, Israel almost very rarely um, issues a building permit. It's very expensive and it's almost impossible to obtain. So most people who don't have a building permit, they end up... Um, I'm getting a home demolition order, especially in Jerusalem. They gave this file to take care of the home demolitions to Ben Gvir, the most radical person. And he insists that as many possible, as many um, homes that he is able to demolish, um, he does. So on average, there has been every day, every week, um, a home demolition. But he has actually, um, he insists on applying a very high fine on people who get their home demolitions. And since October 7th, a large number of Palestinians have decided that just to avoid, in addition to having their home demolished and to paying the fines uh, and the charges, because Palestinians have to pay the charges for having their home demolished, and it's much cheaper for you to demolish your own home. Many Palestinians have started to demolish their own homes. Now there's a new tactic that they're doing, for example, Janin refugee camp, it used to be um, 27,000 people lived, live in it. Now there's less than 3,000 people live in it. Mm -hmm. Because every, you know, they've demolished most of the infrastructures similar to Gaza. It's unbelievable. Similar to Gaza. Um, some of you have been to the Freedom Museum there. Uh, Freedom Theater it is demolished. It's, uh, like, there's nothing left in, in, in Jenin. But now they're, they're using a new tactic. So now it's like they have like every week they have a theme, demolish the 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 kitchens or demolish the cars or ruin the cars the police they go with with the, um, uh, the army i mean the israeli army goes with they don't demolish the house but they demolish the kitchen of the house or the bathrooms of the house so that is like what a mob does not like you would expect a state or a, a state that is regards itself as uh, as a democracy so yes there's plenty of home demolitions taking place and anybody who is now um, has any kind of activism and so on also is under the threat of getting their home demolished. And this is also taking place. We, we live in a, in, a, in a graveyard of homes that are being demolished throughout the country with, with thousands of people who are displaced and, um, and suffering, I mean. Um, another question, this comes in from... Um... Uh, our friend Mark Braverman about um, uh, he asks what is the, what in your view is the role of theology today in the Palestinian struggle for Palestinians for us in the world at large and I guess you know underscoring that I would go back to the origins of Sabil and the importance of liberation theology um, that that you have lived by and worked by for many years. Um, and that in, it includes obviously nonviolent struggle. So, so yeah, where are you uh, in, in your own sense of, of uh, theology and um, uh, uh, as we as we face the, the cataclysm? 
I, I mean, it's basically everybody would assume, everybody with good intentions, or anybody who's with, with the right way of thinking, I would believe, is the thing that when people come together, we develop ideologies, religions, um, theologies, whatever we do is actually that would make life better you know it's better for me and it's better for my neighbor it's better for my community that you know it is the ideologies that we implement and the systems would take care of the people who are on the margins that's the logic you know why would you create a structure as as communities i'd understand if an individual comes and he would like to take over the world and needs to create a stupid ideology that would help stupid people around the world so that this crazy man takes over the world Makes sense, yeah. but people collectively, um, they need to come together to make to find out how we can make the world better for for everyone, including ourselves. Um, most of the people, you know, it is it's really when we when you think of somebody who's a good Christian, let's say, or a good Muslim, or a good Jew, or or a good person, you think it's a person who's good, doesn't lie, doesn't cheat, is not violent, doesn't you know have addictions, or doesn't um. Um, um, doesn't bully others, uh, you know, doesn't mock um, people and their beliefs. So that's what we think of a good person, you know. Um, and, you know, it's somebody who does good things, you know, so you know the tree from its fruits. So religion should be um, should be simply a good, you don't need, theo you do, I don't need a good theological sermon for me to, to feed somebody who's hungry. I don't need a good theological understanding. I don't need to go for five years to a seminary so that if I see somebody who's um, um, who's hungry and cold to give him a cup of uh, soup or or a cup of tea or share my sweater if I have extra sweaters. But that's very basic. Now, sadly, there are people who understand that there is opportunities in religion to control people or to justify unjust ideas. So they develop ideas, whether it is Christian Zionism, whether it is anti-Semitism, whether it is um, Islamic extremism. And then, you know, it is, it's, and they use powerful symbols of religion. So they use texts, Holy Scripture. They say, it is written here, it is written there. That is the will of God. This is what God wants of you. And being good people, you want to obey your boss, and God is the boss for many of us. So you, you, they, they use the word of God or the words in the Bible or scripture to justify this. Theology needs to liberate people um, from this. And what we try to come and do is we, we don't want to get rid of our faith and our identities. We challenge these people who are in, in, in power. Now, we, we the more we get engaged and the more intersectionality you see, you see that there are many people who feel that life is not fair. We try, you know, we try our best. We're trying to be good people. We're trying to, you know, it is it's um, to love one another. We're trying to to live, um, um, uh, to live peacefully. But you find that there is something that is structured that is somehow, and this is like a very profitable structure, is is abusing us and abusing our communities. And that's why when you look at these pro-Palestinian demonstrations, um. You see so many people who are from so many different backgrounds and so many different contexts, they feel that there is something wrong and they feel that there is at least these stupid Palestinians, foolish Palestinians are willing to march and say, um, we're not going to take it and we're going to fight back. And it's much better for us to stand in solidarity with one another than just to get the moral approval of, you know, it is it's a group of Americans or a group of Canadians or a group of uh, Europeans, we, we're going to come and say no, um, hell no, this is unacceptable, and we're going to put our foot down. And that is actually, um, and that is actually the, the beautiful part of Palestinian liberation theology. In Palestinian liberation theology, it is not only we focus on our local context, and we're not seeking Palestinian liberation, we're saying it is groups, of yes. people around the world, regardless of what background or ethnicity or, or religion you come, we are all God's children. And God, from our understanding in Palestinian liberation theology, is a very inclusive God, does not care about what identities we have. Actually, yes. these identities, that's the beauty of the creation of God, is able to create us in so many different ways to keep us interesting. God is also very, um, focuses very much on justice issues. 
and cares about justice. And God really doesn't want us to fight, you know, um, <laughs> and to beat each other up. <laughs> because violence is not good and evil is evil. And you only make evil stronger by using evil methods. Um, although it might feel good to do violence, but it's not the way of God. And it's not going to be helpful for us. Um, and that's why we, we feel that it is, it's being very well received by so many people, liberation theology, Palestinian liberation theology. And we feel it remains a very effective tool of our liberations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there, if there, if there's any glimmer of hope, I mean, at least in the states, the, the demonstrations on campuses and beyond campuses, there is at least uh, seems to be an awakening uh, to a certain extent here in the country. Um, I think connected to that and connected to what you're saying. I want to go to a question that um, another friend of yours and ours, Don Wagner, has put in the chat. Don writes, excuse me, <clears throat> the, geno the genocidal war has already expanded to be a regional war with the fear of Hezbollah, Iran increasing their role. Could you comment on this? Should we keep up our advocacy with Congress and the tone-deaf Biden administration? And, how, and, and in turn, how can we be more effective we can't afford to be tired or indifferent, but how can we be more efficient and effective? This ties into the fact that the Stones cry. I mean, we're going to be in D.C. in September. Um, we want to gather pe people um, and raise our voices. And um, we had some impact in March, um, meeting with uh, uh, staff people of, of from Congress. Um, so you know, there's at least some movement. So, yeah, any response to Don? Yeah. Um, it's like when we started um, this meeting. So, I mean, it is it's at least for me, um, when we started this meeting, we, we raised a prayer and I prayed to God, um, and believing that all power is with God. I didn't pray to any of your Congress members or to your senators or to the White House. Yeah. Although yeah. they're very powerful in the world and they control the world, um, many aspects of the world. And I think it is its power is where it's more symbolic. And I think it is wherever we believe power is, um, power uh, will be. Jesus did not see that power would, was with, with Rome because he did not go to preach in Rome. And Jesus did not believe that the power was with the with the religious leaders. He did not knock their door, nor did he like care about Herod and his or the rich people that surrounded Herod. He was with the poor, and he was with the people. I think we as people we have become more like the world. I understand the logic. You go to your elected um, officials, but our elected officials are no longer the powerful. It shows very clearly that the people are the ones who are powerful. And I would suggest that our advocacy needs to be to boycott um, um, the Congress, the White House, um, the senators, and focus on the people, exactly like Jesus, and from the ground move upwards, because it's it's in the best interest of people that we take we, um, we make this world a better place. It is not in the best interest of your congressmen and your senators to make this world a better place. It's more profitable if it's a broken place. So uh, that is my advice. Like I would no longer um, knock on the doors of uh, of Congress. I only recognize uh, or or political leaders. That is my approach. But the people who believe that there is still hope in the corrupt politi politicians. Um, you know, it is. It's. Um, uh, I hope you're right, because in some they can make the decision process um, easier. Um, but I mean, it is when Jesus wanted to take over Rome. It took four hundred years by the church, for, for, by the fishermen and the basic people, to repent and the tax collectors and so on, and for the empire to lose its power because he went. He worked with the people. I don't think he knew better than to go to Caesar or to yeah. um, to the empire. Yeah, yeah. I'll call people's attention to um, uh, something else on the chat. Um, uh, someone has uh, started a petition in response to Pope Francis saying, "What is needed is you know, I, 
uh, let's see, he must do is going to Gaza, standing for peace, justice, and freedom, started a petition, so folks are, are welcome to sign that. Um, I want to touch on something else um, uh, that uh, uh, Mark uh, Braverman has raised and, and that I, I know is on your minds, the, uh, the Sibyl Conference in November, um, November uh, 17th to the 21st, I believe, um, challenging religious extremism, which will be in Bethlehem and in Jerusalem. Um, so the, uh, let's say a little bit about um, why the focus on religious extremism. Um, um, what we're witnessing, of course, in this country is both Christian Zionism and Christian nationalism in terms of, you know, a response to uh, government. Um, so, yeah, say a little bit about um, the conference and um, and what your focus and concern is there. Um, to liberate religion and to get religion out of the Palestine-Israeli conflict, we need to overcome a number of... Uh, uh, um, we need to, um, to take over a number of religious monsters, I would say. The first one is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism was one of the strongest and continues to be one of the strongest forces in supporting um, the need of Zionism and, uh, and, and justifying Zionism. The only way we understand that there are many people who misuse and weaponize anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism also is real and it exists. Yes. We need to, to challenge um, and to overcome the evil of anti-Semitism. We are also very much aware that it's with Islamophobia. Islamophobia has been used and is being used to demonize anything that is Middle Eastern, everything that is Muslim, um, Palestinians, to, to dispossess us of our humanity. And, you know, then if we lose our humanity, then it is fine to kill us. You know, we are just Muslims. We are Al-Qaeda. We are like the Osama bin Laden. We are a dangerous group of people. And it's very sad um, that this exists, but this is this needs to be addressed. And the third one is Christian Zionism. You know, many uh, radical Christians they have their own interpretations or fantasies or or weird logic that is justifying that it is its or using the Jewish group, uh, people as a tool, um, you know, to bring the Jesus back. And, you know, it's, they believe that they need, we need Armageddon, you know, and we need wars and conflicts so that Jesus comes and brings peace. Uh, although logically you say, you know, what would make peace and bring the kingdom of God is doing justice, doing peace building, do, you know, showing uh, compassion and forgiveness. That, that is the, these are the ingredients of a, the kingdom of God. It's not the war and hatred and lying and dispossession, you know. It's but some people have charisma. Some people have the ability to persuade. Some people have resources. Some people have interests in such lunatic ideas, and it's our role as people of faith to come and say we refuse um, that our faith. God, our God is taken as a hostage and being justified is being used to justify the dispossession of and and, and the torture and then just and causing injustice to Muslims, Christians, and Jews or any people, uh, despite of their uh, identity. Um, what are you seeing in terms of uh, Christians there um, in Jerusalem in the Holy Land? I mean, we know historically there's been an exit. Um, uh, what are you experiencing yourself from Christians on the ground? And yeah, hey, Christians on the ground are similar to Christians on the ground in in uh, in, in, in the U.S. and many parts of the world. Some some decide that it is it's just it's becoming you know it's Palestine is just becoming. The Holy Land is becoming a terrible place to live in, and they are seeking um, life outside. Many Americans are moving to Canada or going to Europe and saying, you know, it's, life is becoming too difficult. You know, we don't like the options that we're, we're facing, and it's becoming a difficult place. 
Others, they like to live in the, on their own island. You know, they create their own sphere, their bubble. Even in Palestine, um, they're trying just to be like observers. They go to work. They go to the grocery shop. They, they go out maybe like once a month for ice cream. And they try to disconnect themselves from the uh, from uh, from what's taking place um, um, in their own country or in their own context. Yet, even as much as they try to avoid being involved, it's very difficult. It's the system continues to target them and uh, and to affect them. And sadly, we have some Christians who are like you know it is it's they they get tempted from power. You know, collaborating with power is very tempting. And yeah. some of the people lose their ethical positions and their values and so on, and they betray Jesus, like Judas, you know, for go for for the coins of silver. <laughs> and there are people who come and they say, you know, it is it's like it's we need to fight back and we need to use different methods um, of fighting back. I believe definitely people who who appreciate life and appreciate um, their history and their her heritage. And understand that it is it's we would like to be the salt of the earth. We would like to be present here in Palestine and Israel. We are Palestinian. This is our these this is our communities. We need to fight back, but we cannot fight evil with evil. We have to create an alternative to what the empire, um, what the powers are are forcing us, and to show that it is it's actually you can show kindness. You can show. Um, love and you can show it by non-violence. Non-violence helps you to preserve your humanity and the humanity of your oppressor. Yeah. So that's our cases. We were divided into these groups, and sometimes we ourselves become collaborators. Sometimes we we wish we could escape. Okay. Sometimes you know it is it's, we try to disconnect ourselves from the whole conflicts. We're yeah, we'd like everyone. Yeah. Um, before we finish, um, you know, just on a personal note, I think we, we have a sense of, of um, just uh, I, the, the word I used before was the weight that you yourself are feeling. Um, just say a little bit about, you know, think about your own trajectory with Sabeel um, um, and kind of where you are now and what, what keeps you going. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's sometimes it's it's like I, every day I wake up and on the determination to do something um, inspiring and to do something that is very hopeful. Sometimes, mm -hmm. honestly, I I, um, I wake up because it's just that's out of stubbornness, you know. That's <laughs> my community, and there's no way out. And you know, it is I refuse to let go for uh, into depression and uh, stupidity, and I decide to. I need to fight the wolves, you know, um, um, that are attacking my community. So I do it out of, you know, with the sense of, because I'm on survival mode. Sometimes I wake up and I do it, you know, it's, I believe that it's, I do it because it's, I think maybe that's the recipe. We need to do work for justice and peace in a, a collaborative method, because that's the recipe, how to make the world a better place. Because the alterna alternative sucks. It's wars, <laughs> nuclear bombs, and you know it is. It's, and this is what they're pushing us. They're trying to create the logic of Hamas and the logic of Benigvir and the logic of Biden and Trump. Is that you know it is it for you to survive in the world? It's a difficult neighborhood. You need to have a very big red button, and it needs to be a button that works and a very powerful button. But imagine if all of our leaders around the world, everybody has a red button and everybody, you know, is able to um, find that the best way is to make sure that we have all have strong weapons and strong arms and we're able to, to inflict more damage to one another. That is a recipe of a catastrophe. I believe as human beings, as people of faith, we should be able to intervene. I don't want to sit in a nuclear shelter. I don't think I have the luxury to sit in a nuclear shelter. But at least the less people come to say that I wish somebody did something um, about it. We need to avoid this scenario altogether. It is all in our best interest. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to uh, let you have a final word and perhaps a, a you know a, a call again to those of us on on this call, um, especially as we move towards September. Um, but but just to thank you again to our sponsoring organizations, 
Um, and a reminder that the next webinar is this Thursday. It's coming up just in three days uh, with Rifat Cassis from Global Kairos Justice and Kairos Palestine, along with Munther Isaac from the Christmas Lutheran Church and uh, director of the Christ at the Checkpoint. Um, so Omar, you know, may, maybe you you said what you need to say to us, but but yeah, I mean, um, uh, what what would you have us do? Um, I, you, you you don't seem very optimistic about uh, us descending on Washington and uh, changing a lot of minds there, but um, yeah, um, uh, you know, yeah. final final charge. Um. I think it's what I can tell you. I mean, whatever I tell to the U.S. Uh, political leaders, they don't care. I'm not an American citizen. I'm not a voter. They have no interest in me. I'm just another civilian living in, in the Middle East, you know. And I don't think that our self-interest is, um, um, is a priority for them. One of the U.S. politicians mentioned in one of the delegations that we've met, um, and he said, do not assume you come from faith communities, you're Christians or whatever, you come and you speak the language of ethics and what is the better ethical decisions that needs to be taken. That is not the language of Washington. Washington is a political place where we are supposed to defend the political interests of our country and of our citizens. And most of the time, these contradict ethical decisions. So you as citizens of the world, you as, as people of faith who believe that we are able to make the world a better place, is I, I strongly say that you need to create leverage to you. The only leverage that you have in a democratic state today is your votes. I, come, I say that you need to make the difficult decision. I know it's very difficult this year, but do not make, um, do not let, the decision makers believe that your vote is for granted. Just because there is a worse scenario, that means that they do not have to do much to make this world a better place. If we want our voices to be heard, decision makers need to come and say that there's a price for them. I don't think that anybody should be voting for Biden. Biden has so much blood on, their, on his hand. You know, we will not, um, I believe, honestly, it's not like, we will not blame you if Trump wins, but we will blame you if you have voted for Biden, who has submitted hundreds of uh, millions of uh, dollars or billions of dollars to bomb and to starve our people and to demolish our churches and our mosques. This is how we feel. This is how we feel. I know it's completely complicated in the U.S., but you guys are funding our genocide. And you can either say that I refuse, we wash our hands from um, from the decisions of Washington, or you continue to show them that you that they can take your votes for granted. Yeah, as voters, we are between a rock and a hard place. Um, um, yeah. Uh, let me just finish. Uh, I'm going to quote um, uh, uh, another uh, message here on uh, on the chat. Um, uh, Hannah, who says, I'm going to make an Instagram quote of what you said, Omar. Every day I wake up and work for peace and justice because the alternative sucks. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, thank you, my friend. Um, um, our, our prayers are with you. Um, a reminder of the uh, Sabil conference in November, and there's information about that on the Sabil website. And a reminder about the um, webinar on Thursday with Rifat Cassis and Munther Isaac. Omar, um, we continue to pray for you. Um, we continue to find ways to come over and we continue to try to find ways to raise our voices here um, in the States, uh, you know, uh, under, um, you know, freedom, but with uh, just. At, at times a despair uh, of change but um we continue to do the work and um our hearts and our our, our love are, are with you thanks so much